Welcome to What's Eating Harlem. I'm Vanessa Tyler. There is a lot going on in Harlem. Let's get started. What can be more New York than a bodega? But when it's in Harlem, there's a twist. Like 100 varieties of rum at La Bodega 47 Social Club. This was the only big ballroom where, back in the day, blacks could eat, drink, and be merry. And now, these Harlem residents don't want to see it go. The fight to save the Renaissance Ballroom in Harlem. One look and you know they must live in Harlem. It's a certain style. Check out who our Selena Hill is spotlighting in Harlem style. Be transformed to a time when music satisfies the soul. Here Lady Leah belted out in Harlem. All of that on this edition of What's Eating Harlem. Eating Harlem, funded in part by Cove Lounge. Situated in the heart of Harlem, it embodies the spirit and vitality of its community, delivering a unique blend of cool sophistication and urban edge. Also made possible by Chocolat, Harlem's fine dining at its best. Everyone meets at the bar at Chocolat, 120th and 8th, 2223 Frederick Douglass Boulevard, Chocolat Restaurant Lounge. It is on tonight. La Bodega 47 Social Club is, well, very social. Even on a random Wednesday, they are packing them in. No, sometimes I'm amazed. We, we'll sit here and be amazed, like, who are these people? Where do they come from? How have they heard about us? Owner Brian Washington Palmer has not really done any advertising. In fact, if you were to see this new hot spot on the restaurant row of Lennox on the corner of Malcolm X and 118th, you would probably think it is a bodega. And inside, with walls and doors that look like shelves of food, who could blame you for thinking this is the bodega that traditionally sat on most corners in Harlem? East Harlem, West Harlem, we all had the bodega. We know what a bodega is as New Yorkers. The bodega was your source of news, of information. You had your, at the time, fruits and vegetables, your gossip, you played your numbers, hence the 47, the lucky 47, that you played the numbers at the bodega. So much centered on your newspaper, your coffee, it was just such a routine. But times have changed in Harlem, and so have the bodegas. They've already disappeared pretty much. Now they are gourmet delis. Which is why La Bodega 47 Social Club is on a mission to keep at least this bodega in Harlem. A cigar-chomping grandma greets you in a real cozy private space. It just sets the mood for celebration. The wall of rum makes it all that much better. We are actually a rum-focused bar. Uh, we have uh, about 130, 140 rums, between 130, 150 rums, give or take. Largest rum selection on the East Coast. Uh, so that's our focus as far as spirits. We do carry everything, however. It is the food designed to inspire the palate. Coming our way, a couple of appetizers. Who can go wrong with wings? But these wings feature an Asian twist, sweet and spicy. Also hitting with something different, their short rib. That is mashed yuca on the side, creamier than plain potatoes. And nothing says Latin than beans and rice with sweet plantains and garlic spinach. I would say it's a blend of, of Latin, American with Latin and Caribbean influences. So something for everyone, vegan, vegetarians, all shareable, all recognizable dishes, little twist and takes, but still basic American comfort. Brian is not new to this, but true to this. Although a professionally trained dancer who has lived around the world, he has run restaurants uptown for years. And if the location seems familiar, it is. Remember Native? He owned that too on the same spot. I, we were pioneers at the time in the neighborhood. And usually what happens is the pioneer starts the movement, but they, they can never benefit from it. They never profit from it. It's all the newcomers who come in and who have it. I'm not going out as a pioneer. I'm going to stay in and, and be with it. In it for the long haul. As he looks around, he sees new faces in Harlem. 
Harlem has really changed. If you look around, we have, and I call it by beyond the bougie blacks. We have the teachers. We have the uh, the white sorority girls. We have definitely a couple of tourists. We have the alternative couple, a couple of older folks. I mean that, and everyone's just here blending, talking. Like it's, it's like it's one big friendly thing, and it's what we think of New York. And sometimes we're very happy to look around and go, "This is New York. It's in here." At the corner of 138th Street and Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard, there is an urgent cry. The plea from the people? Save Harlem now. They say Harlem history is at stake. I've never been to Paris, but for me, um, Harlem is a special place and the Renaissance therefore is as special as the Moulin Rouge or um, any number of monuments in Paris that one can go to. While those monuments may live forever, this Harlem site is headed for the wrecking ball. The Renaissance ballroom and casino, built back in the 1920s, is a shell of what it used to be. I see skies of blue. There was a time when all the greats played here. Satchmo, Billie Holiday, Ella Fitzgerald, you name it. And for blacks at the time, the Renaissance was everything. They partied here, basketball was played here, they were welcomed here. It was black owned, black run, black enjoyed. All over America, in the North and in the South, theaters and many other amusement places were se strictly segregated. So, and even in black Harlem, with Harlem being a primarily African American community, as late as the 1940s, in most theaters in Harlem, if you were black, you had to sit in the balcony. In Harlem, the Renaissance welcomed everyone, but when it opened, it automatically became the leading venue for African Americans to host any kind of events that they had. The huge facility had a theater on one end, the big ballroom on the other, where they would lindy hop the night away. All the memories. Yeah, this is where I had my first date, and I met my wife in Small's Paradise, too. So these great old rooms really resonate with me, and, and I just don't understand how anyone would want to take down something with so much culture. Small's is gone, but it is not too late yet for the Renaissance, because in addition to the ballroom, this was also the home to ball players, the New York Wrens. And if parts of the building is saved, a small section would be ideal for a museum or at least a display of Wrens memorabilia. Yeah, well, among the other culturally and historically priceless things that have to do with this building is also the fact that black basketball history started here. Um, the first African-American fully professional basketball team was a team called the New York Renaissance, Big Five that played its home games here for a generation. And they were not only dominant among all black teams, but they were also dominant in general. Uh, they beat teams like the, like the Globetrotters, like the original Celtics and others. And before the NBA was formed in 1950, people don't realize this, but they had 10 years worth of an event called the World Championship of Professional Basketball. And the first one was in 1939, and it was won by the New York Wrens. 
the Renaissance is one of those rare instances of a non-church which was built for black people, by black people. William Roach built the theater portion back in 1922. He was a man with a vision, even had the tiles that rim the top imported from Tunisia. Before that, he was a butler for this guy who owned theaters. And he determined from that experience of working for this white man who built theaters, that he wanted in Harlem to build a theater that would be as fine as any comparable theater was that White's free. The preservationists say they were told when Abyssinian Church took over the dilapidated structure, which by the way, provided the movie location for the fictional drug den called the Taj Mahal in Spike Lee's iconic movie, Jungle Fever. They say they were assured any construction would include saving the facade. But the church sold the site to a developer for $15 million, and there are no guarantees. In fact, Artist renderings of the proposed condos taken from websites and newspaper accounts show no sign of the Renaissance except the name. The condos will be called the Rennie. With so many changes going on here in Harlem, these residents say they just want to keep a little bit of history. Even with all the changes and everything that is shiny and bright, why not keep a bit of the old with all that is new? And that's why when people today, they say, oh, well, you know, you don't want this apartment building and uh, you don't want for gentrification in Harlem, that just makes you a racist. And I say, I'm not a racist, but I am a realist and a person who believes in my own self-preservation. And I believe that there should be a place for me in New York somewhere. And why shouldn't it be the African-American cultural capital of Harlem, which uh, is this remarkable place that wouldn't have flourished or survived were it not for my ancestors who lived here. And why should I want to be pushed out of where I live? So what's next? Since there is no landmark status, they will appeal to the developer, who they say is African-American himself, to save Harlem history. I say shame because it's cultural genocide. Anyone should be ashamed to participate and destroying something that means so much. Harlem wants to get you involved. You got a story idea? Tell us. Go to our website, whatseatingharlem.com. There you can become a member and get discounts to some of the places we feature. Be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. I'm Selena Hill, and this is Harlem Style. Joy Azeze is a Harlemite with an innovative style that has been noted at the New York Times, Italian Vogue, and Seventeen Magazine. As a stylist, a style blogger, a published author, and the co-founder of CurlSisters.com, her love for fashion is evident in her daily work and in her personal style. Now she's worked at WWV and Essence, but you can check out her own personal styling tips on her own YouTube channel, you can also check out her whole portfolio of work on joylovesfashion.com. And now today, we're gonna talk to her right here at the Chocolat restaurant about her Harlem style. My mom, she's very stylish. And she just has so much vintage that she had from like the 80s and 90s. And she'd be giving them to me as, as I got older, as I was, you know, becoming a teenager into my 20s. She'd give me all this vintage. And that kind of helped me with the foundation of my wardrobe. I would define my personal style as being very, um, very individualized. Uh, I go off my feeling, however I'm feeling that day. I uh, just kind of dress for that mood. Definitely fearless. I was working at a magazine called WWD, 
I was in the fashion closet seeing all these beautiful dresses come in from Paris and all these wonderful designers and that really helped me to see how to dress high and low because you know here I was like one of five interns in a closet <laughs> with all these racks and racks of clothing so that gave me the early on look of how to mix pieces to make them work for you as an individual and not just be wearing things because they're trendy. As a fashion a writer and stylist why do you say having a personal style is so important? Like, How do you advise your you know, different clientele, different people? Why is that important? It's important because it makes you feel like you and you can really shine and your personality can be like your calling card like, as you, in the way you dress. So rather than going and telling someone, hey, I'm creative, I'm fun, you can show that in your style. This is my style living in Harlem. I've lived here for, uh, well, four years. And I love the old Harlem look of the people that are a little older and how they love to, you know, wear great suits and cool hats. I've kind of incorporated a little bit of that into my style today. And I love that historic feeling of Harlem. I just like to have fun when I'm getting dressed. I kind of start with one item. Today it was um, the hat, actually. I went from the hat and then said, okay, I need a fun, like, you know, neutral sweater. And then I went for this, like, wine-colored skirt. Just to kind of not be too overwhelming, but be a nice pop. So if it's unique, and it's fabulous, then it must be Harlem style. I'm Selena Hill. From the mouth of Lady Leah comes the most soothing, beautiful sounds. Alfie, a classic just like her. Oh, but I love that song. That was my mother's favorite song. That was my mother's favorite song. And as I grew older and started to understand the meaning of the song, I'm like, oh my God, yes, of course. I, I would want that on my initial, my debut album. Yes, debut album. See, what you may not know, you have just stepped into a dream and she is in heaven. Thank you all. Thank you for this glorious turnout. Thank you so much. Don't wake her on this glorious night in Harlem at the So Chic Cherie Restaurant on Lenox Restaurant Row, 121st and 122nd in Malcolm X Boulevard, owned by host extraordinaire Alam Uch. It is wall to wall, all eyes and ears on Lady Leah. Finally, her magnificent wish has been granted. This was a dream come true. Um, I've been singing all my life and I just started singing professionally about five years ago. And so I had been thinking, wow, I'd really like to do a CD and seem like, you know, trying to get a band together. I'd get a band together and then they'd have another gig. And so I was always changing musicians. Well, finally, to get one group and to be able to rehearse and actually record something get it in to the engineer's booth and have it on a disc and then to have a release party where I think we had over 200 people here tonight. It was just, it was more than I could ask for. I, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. No matter how long it took, getting in the studio and creating this album was something she was born to do. Growing up in Ohio, the house was filled with music. Her mother was a singer and her father too. My father was a, uh, the minister of music in my home church and my mother worked nights and so when he was at home with us and we were really little, he would have us around the piano and that was our fun. It was also her first gig since the family took their act on the road, the Pearson family. She called it like the gospel version of the Jackson 5. I fell in love with you the first time I looked into them their eyes. But for Lady Leah, life got in the way and music took a back seat. I waited so long. You know, I'm not uh, one of these teeny boppers who's just out of high school uh, doing music. I mean, I 
have been married and I've had children and I even have a little grandson and I'm finally out now on my own and being able to do my music and it just really feels like I've been waiting I've been kind of tucked away and now I'm off the shelf <laughs> off the shelf perfect title for her debut album and her type of music perfect for the venues now offering live music in Harlem I love music that has good lyrics that the melodies are good the changes in the chords are, are stimulating. Um, you know, when you listen to really good music, you feel it viscerally. I thought it was great. Of course, this is not the first time I'm seeing um, Lady Lee. I've been here for brunch, and it's been outstanding. What did I think? I thought it was a great show. Well, what's next is, believe it or not, I have an audition for The Voice coming up in two weeks. And uh, we'll see what that what that does and where that takes me. That's all the time we have for now, but there's much more next time on What's Eating Harlem. I'm Vanessa Tyler. See you uptown. What's Eating Harlem, funded in part by Cove Lounge, situated in the heart of Harlem. It embodies the spirit and vitality of its community, delivering a unique blend of cool sophistication and urban edge. Also made possible by Chocolat, Harlem's fine dining at its best. Everyone meets at the bar at Chocolat, 120th and 8th, 2223 Frederick Douglass Boulevard, Chocolat Restaurant Lounge. To become a member of What's Eating Harlem, go to www.whatseatingharlem.com and sign up for special events like wine tastings and food tastings. Also, join us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. If you have any ideas for stories about Harlem, send them to info at whatseatingharlem.com.